And getting data into documents is tricky, as anybody who's ever done an Excel merge knows. And <laughs> seriously, right, it's hard. Getting documents into data is even harder, which is the entire mess of content management systems. Right, scanning documents, all of that. <laughs> These two things don't mix together at all that. So we come out through the 90s, and you kind of get to mid-95, maybe, urban 96, and people suddenly realize that one day in the future you'll be able to make money on the internet. There's just one problem. There's no security, which means if you type your credit card into an internet form, it will be bounced all around the internet. Anybody can read it, and they can steal money out of your account. It's another five years until we get a widely deployed solution that allows us to have encryption, which lets us move credit cards around the internet. E-commerce doesn't really become a thing until, what, 1999, 2000, right? So we're already here. By the time you've got a computer that is capable of taking a payment from you know, the, the internet. Again, how fast is the rate of change? Does anybody even remember when you couldn't put credit cards into the internet? I mean, you're all alive. But we forget so quickly what was possible or impossible when new technology arrived. You're just going to wash the memory out. It's quite hard even to think about what it was like before we had cell phones. So you come forward to 2010. By 2010, I'm going to suggest that more or less everything you can do on a web page has been done to at least the first approximation. More or less, all the basic stuff was there. If you could do it with a computer that was basically a paper simulator, it had been done, more or less. Now, this is also roughly when Bitcoin gets started. And Bitcoin starts in some you know, festering little weird counterculture on the internet, which I spent my entire 1990s in, called cyberpunk. And the cyberpunks are straight out of science fiction. They can't tell the difference between science fiction and reality. They, generally speaking, have an emotional intelligence quotient of around 75 to 50. Uh, it took me a long time to grow out of that. And one of the things which makes that seem work the way that it does is the enormous prevalence of autism. So whenever you hear somebody ragging on the nerds, right? Whenever you hear somebody ragging on the nerds, remember what they're doing, generally speaking, is picking on autistic people, right? It's really important to understand that the people building the technologies on which your society completely depends, the people without whom the lights go out and the food stays cold, are heavily, heavily, heavily tending towards being on the autistic spectrum. So when you hear people laughing at the nerds, remember they're laughing at people that are disabled. They're also the people that your civilization depends on, so don't be screwed. <laughs> so the cypherpunks come out and basically say, in a very naive way, why do we need government? And they go and they build this thing, which is essentially a central bank of the internet. Now, you sort of think, well, that was a bit of a big jump. How did we go from, we can finally take the credit card to central bank of the internet, right? That's what all of us spent about five years wondering as well. What the hell did they do, right? Because the technology arrived wrong. We could go and ask what Satoshi's intent was because Satoshi was a ghost, right? The software was dropped onto the internet, there was some early discussion, and then the guy vanished. So we have no idea who Satoshi was. We don't know what the intent was. There was nobody to go to conferences to pitch the technology. We were left with an artifact that, to all intents and purposes, might have been created by a time traveler and dropped. It's that big a jump. Um, so what did they do? What they did was this, right? Back over here, the databases were singular. They existed in, a, in an atomic state, one database per enterprise. The network existed in some relational sense between enterprises, but because the database was perceived as being too fragile to let anybody touch, the database never directly communicated with the network. You always had lots and lots and lots of guards and buffers and other stuff in between to prevent the two things working properly. And if you did actually connect the databases kind of directly to each other, you got another problem, which was the database encoded the worldview of the organization. Two organizations, two different worldviews. You always needed something in between to translate. So you'd never got large scale computer to computer connections that allowed you to create a shared model of reality between lots of different organizations. And this shows up every day when you try and do something like process a, a claim on insurance, and you have to fill in the name and address detail 74 times for different organizations, often three or four times for the same organization. 
The databases are kept separate from each other. There's no real connectivity between them. And when you try and build connections between the systems, the complexity builds to the point where it's too expensive to do. So what they say, you know, mean when they say the word distributed database, is a database which is both like a database and like a network. And this is the genius of Bitcoin. It fuses together the database and the network into a seamless whole called the blockchain. Everywhere there is data, there is network, and everywhere there is network, there is data. They're completely fused inside of these systems. So what that means is rather than having all of these individual kind of ivory tower computer systems connected by a network and then all the costs of moving things in and out, you have a single shared story of reality spread across all of the machines simultaneously. And when it changes in one place, it changes everywhere. And this is such a powerful abstraction, it's such a powerful technology, that the first thing they implemented was the central bank of the internet. That was the first thing they did. Can you imagine what Act 2 and 3 are going to look like? Right? We open by creating a single global currency, which is the first thing that has worked that way since we went off the gold standard. And the technology deployed is so powerful that it was done by either one individual or a small group that remained secret. They basically reinvented gold. And that was the first move. <laughs> this is unimaginable strangeness. For somebody that spent their entire lifetime monkeying around with computers, oh my God, what have we done? So you get up to kind of where we are now, right? Basically 2015, 2016. We're sort of midway through the process. Bitcoin is well established as a reality. Everybody is comfortable with Bitcoin's existence to some degree. What is it? It's a bank account that stores magic internet money that comes from the central bank of the internet, which is a decentralized database, which is everywhere and over, maintained by a bunch of people who don't understand. <laughs> but the funny thing is that if I describe to you how your government works, it's even worse. <laughs> so every four years, we hold a popularity contest regionally. We pick the person that is most likable on television, more or less regardless of their value, we know nothing about them because they're protected by privacy that surrounds most individuals. So they could be a person playing a role. And then we assemble these people into a large group that gets to decide who lives and who dies every day. Right. So you know, don't assume that because the new stuff is weird, it's any weirder than the old stuff. The old stuff is just weird stuff you got used to. Now, let me move a little forward to this whole smart company. So the smart contract is the third big integrative step. First we merge the network and the database to make the blockchain. Then we take computer software code and put it into the shared database, into the blockchain. So we take a little program, and they can only be little because it's just the beginning of the story, and we take the little program and we store it in the blockchain. And that means everybody that's connected to the blockchain has the copy of exactly the same program, and programs, when you run the program, same data, same code, same result. So now, everybody's got a copy of the database, everybody's got a copy of the code, we all run the code at the same time, we all put the output back into the blockchain. If there's a disagreement, we find it immediately, we sort it out. So in that sort of environment, you have these little programs which are just as transactional as sending people money. It's like a wire transfer. You hit the go here, the money flows across the network, it pops up there. It's like a Bitcoin payment. What kind of things do the little programs do? If this job has been done, a Bob. If the job hasn't been done by the 31st of March, send the money back to Alan. Tiny, tiny little pieces of business logic pulled out of the application stack and put onto the blockchain instead. And this is the third big unification. Uh, I work for a company called Consensus Systems that uses Ethereum, which is the first really durable smart contract platform, to build lots of applications. And those little programs do things like make sure that artists get paid when their music is listened to. They do things like streamline transactions between banks. They do all kinds of simple, useful things. And we're still only at the very beginning of the story. Uh, right now, the Bitcoin system processes about seven transactions a second. The Ethereum system does something like 20. 
So these are way back in terms of speed. They're way back over there where computers were in the 1960s on punched cards. Now, brace yourself. Right now, the challenge is to produce a thing called a scaled blockchain. And a scaled blockchain is a blockchain that doesn't do 20 transactions a second. It does roughly the same number of transactions a second as Visa or SWIFT. 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 transactions a second, quarter of a million transactions a second. And the scaled blockchain is something that begins to provide us with something that looks like a global computing surface onto which things like the internet of things could be loaded. You could take the entire global financial system and push it into a scaled blockchain. You could take the entire internet of things and push it into a scaled blockchain. You could take all of those machines in the cloud you could put blockchain software onto them, as Microsoft recently did with a thing called Azure, and then you could have a single global computing surface that took all of our different bits and pieces of computing power and turned them into a global knowledge resource that basically manages the fundamental infrastructures of our society instead of the cobbled together nonsense that you get every time you talk to your bank.